Okay, so my talk is on sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Uh, this is something pretty common that we see in our sports musculoskeletal spine clinic. Uh, we at the hospital and the university have a spine center where we see patients, rehabilitation, medicine doctors, spine surgeons, pain management, neurology, physical therapy. We all see patients together in the same center. And the reason I picked this talk is because I think we underdiagnose sacroiliac joint dysfunction. So even when, when my residents see a patient in the clinic and they present to me and they often say muscle pain or disc herniation, more often than not, in my experience, it ends up being sacroiliac joint dysfunction. So I will share some of my thoughts and then we'll uh, keep it open for questions. So, you know, the, the biggest controversy in sacroiliac joint dysfunction is, does the joint move? Some people say the joint is immobile. There are many, many ligaments that connect the sacrum to the ilium, and therefore this joint is immobile, therefore it cannot be a source of pain. There's another group that says there is mobility. It's micromotion. So that micromotion usually manifest by some type of muscle imbalance. Hip flexors are tight, the glutes, the hip abductors are weak, and that imbalance of antagonistic muscles causes some dysfunction of the sacroiliac joint. I'm in that group. I believe there is some micromotion. When that micromotion becomes pathologic, then patients can get pain. It makes sense that there's motion to me anyway, due to the fact that we have babies. I mean, I don't have babies, but Humans have babies, and in order to accommodate for vaginal delivery, something has to move. Pubic symphysis has to move, this SI joint has to move, something has to give. So I believe that there is some pathologic micromotion that causes sacroiliac joint pain. Uh, just a review of the anatomy, we know the pelvis is shaped differently between males and females. The female pelvis is more gynecoid, it's wider, again, to allow for birth. The pelvis, the male pelvis is more unicoid, it is more vertically oriented and, and less wide. The reasons why those have implications is because they have different stresses on the sacroiliac joint. The face, the articular surface of the sacroiliac joint in women tends to be bigger. In men, it tends to be smaller. In men, the ligaments tend to be stronger. In women, they tend to be less strong or not as much compared to the articular surface, which is why women tend to get SI joint pathology a little bit more than men. Uh, just again, more pictures on anatomy, the pubic tubercle in the front, the acetabulum, and then many, many ligaments that connect the sacrum to the ilium. There's also muscles that are relevant when speaking of sacroiliac joint pain. Probably the most sensitive thing a patient can tell you when it comes to sacroiliac joint pain is the location of where it hurts. That is probably the most sensitive test that we have, and we're going to go over sensitivity and se specificity specificity in a second, but where they have pain. So if they're pressing in their glutes over the piriformis, it's probably not sacroiliac joint. If they're pressing at another location over the posterior superior iliac spine, the dimples, probably SI joint pain. So we'll show some of that data as well. Looking at the anatomy of the sacroiliac joint, as I mentioned, there is an articular surface which has some synovial fluid, that is the minority of the sacroiliac joint. The rest of the sacroiliac joint is mostly ligamentous or fibrocartilage. And I believe most of the pain comes from that portion of the joint. It's not a true arthropathy or arthritis like we get in our big joints, our hips, our knees, our shoulders. I think it is the fibrous part, the proximal part of the joint, the superior part of the joint that causes some of the pain. And I'm gonna show pictures on how we, or how I used to do injections for sacroiliac. I have changed that in the past five years, injecting the top portion of the joint and not the bottom. If you look at it in cross-section um, or bisected, you can see the inferior portion of the joint is synovial, about a third. The top portion of the joint is fibrous and ligamentous. That makes up the majority of the sacroiliac joint. And again, I apologize, you don't have slides. I will get them all to you. So the prevalence of SI joint pain. There was a study done at the University of Pennsylvania in 2006, 2007, Dr. Slipman. 
he suggested that the incidence of sacroiliac joint kind of goes down as we age. The incidence of disc herniation and discogenic pain kind of go down as we age, but the incidence of facet joint or facet mediated pain goes up. So 25% of people less than 50 who present with pack pain likely have a sacroiliac joint problem versus facet arthritis, less than 50 years old. The challenge with sacroiliac joint pain is that despite taking a history, despite knowing the physical examination maneuvers, nothing is really that specific to confirm that the pain is coming from the SI joint. And in fact, the gold standard way, the way we practice in the United States, to confirm sacroiliac joint pain is after a positive response to an injection. So if you think it's SI joint pain, you can start treating it with some of the modalities and treatments that I will tell you about. But if you really want to confirm the diagnosis, it's through an anesthetic, a lidocaine injection. If the pain goes away, then it was sacroiliac joint pain. It's kind of counterproductive to the way we kind of teach in physiatry, where we rely on physical exam, we rely on history to confirm and to make a diagnosis. With sacroiliac joint pain, it's a little bit different. So there are four tests that demonstrate good sensitivity. The first is sacral sulcus tenderness, SS tenderness, 89% sensitive. Buttock pain, a little less sensitive than the PSIS test, which I will show you in a second. The specificity of all of these tests is very poor. And even if you combine the tests with three positives or two negatives, very sensitive to rule things in, poor specificity to rule things out. And I'll show you that again in a second. A common diagram that we see when we see patients with sacroiliac joint pain, this could be a drawing that they present with. Often I see it radiating down into the buttock. Often I see it radiating into the groin, into the thigh. Sometimes you might see it radiating into the foot. So when patients or when, when residents or med students see a picture like this, they're automatically thinking probably sciatica, probably disc herniation. So they start testing the patient with neural tension signs, slump sit, straight leg raise, and oftentimes you can miss the diagnosis just based on this picture. And the reason that's relevant is that the referral pattern for the sacroiliac joint pain is not consistent. It could go in the dermatome of the L5 nerve. It could go in the distribution of an L5 S1 facet pain syndrome because the proximity of the proximal SI joint and the L5 S1 facet joint is very close. So oftentimes, even in my clinic, it's very tough to differentiate between facet pain and sacroiliac joint pain. Certainly, some of these provocative exam maneuvers can help, but again, if I'm gonna treat one of these pain syndromes with an intervention, then the gold standard is a lidocaine injection. And then I can proceed with radiofrequency ablation or things of that nature, which I'll discuss. So maximal tender, tenderness at the PSIS or the sacral sulcus. Again, this is where, we're, where the dimples are. Everyone has dimples. They're hidden there somewhere. Sometimes pain can refer to the groin, the thigh. Uh, on history, I think the most telling is when the patient says, I have pain with transition from sitting to standing. So while I'm sitting, it begins to hurt. Then I stand up and the first few steps are very painful and then the patient continues to walk and it gets better. That is the classic presentation for sacroiliac joint pain. If this was a disc herniation, you would think pain with sitting gets better with standing and remains better with walking. If you think it's facet arthritis, less pain with sitting, maybe pain with transition, but then worse pain with standing and walking because you're loading the facet joints. So that part of the history kind of clues me into what I'm thinking about. Again, it's not very specific to tell me what the problem is, but it gives me an idea. If the patient says, you know, they work at a desk or they work like all of us, and when they stand up, it hurts first few steps and then it gets better, then you're thinking SI joint. Has anyone had sacroiliac joint pain? No one? No, I mean th themselves. Yeah. Is that consistent with how you felt when you had it? I had SI joint pain, I play golf and tennis, and I had it, and I know every time I got up it hurt, but then in clinic as I was moving it would get better. So I cheated and got an injection instead of doing my exercises. Uh, physical exam, so sacral sulcus, this is the dimples of venous. Just another example of where they describe the pain. Very sensitive, 
history and exam, not very specific. Modified Thompson test, again, this is trying to look at uh, hip flexors. I believe we all suffer from tight hip flexors because we're all doing what we're doing right now. We all sit a lot more than we stretch. We all shorten the hip flexor more than we strengthen our hip abductor and our glutes, which are antagonistic. And for that reason, I believe a lot of us suffer from disc pathology. Remember the iliopsoas muscle, the hip flexor muscle? It originates on the transverse processes, L2, L3, L4. So when those muscles are tight, they're pushing on the disc, they're pushing on the facet joints. So it's not uncommon when you have someone come with back pain. It's not a spine issue at all. It's actually a muscle issue. It's actually hip flexors. So stretching out the hip flexors can be very beneficial for a lot of our patients. So this is an exam maneuver that you can do just to test hip flexors, not necessarily for SI joint. Patrick's test or Faber's test, which is flexion, abduction, external rotation. And if the pain is, if the uh, test is positive, the patient will report posterior buttock pain. If they report groin pain, and that's something I have to tell the residents, residents come and present and they say positive Patrick's test. And I say, where does it hurt? They're like, in the groin. And that's not a positive test. That just, they have groin pain because you stressed out their adductors. So where they report pain with the Pat Patrick's test is very important. Gainsland's test, again, is forced passive hip flexion with holding the contralateral leg down, and that will report ipsilateral sacroiliac pain if there's some pathology there. Yeoman's test, also looking at hip flexors, femoral nerve. Patient is prone. You support their lower back. This picture is not perfect. There should be a hand on the lower back causing passive um, flexion of the, of the thigh, and if there's reproduction of pain in the buttock or in the anterior thigh, again, not super specific for sacroiliac joint pain, but could show that there's some type of muscle imbalance. Compression and distraction tests. Again, I'm just giving you all the different things that we could do uh, to look for SI joint pathology. Gillet test or agility test, however you want to say it. Basically, you're looking at pelvic asymmetries. So you put your hands on the top of the iliac crest, put your thumbs over the PSIS or where the dimples are, and you have the patient flex one hip up. If there is depression of the downside or rotation of the hip flex side with pain, it's a positive test. If there's no pain, then you know, we don't have to worry about it, but basically it's looking at pain. So putting all these tests together, you can see from here, sensitivity of the sacral sulcus is 95%, very poor specificity. And what does that mean? What does sensitivity mean? If a test is very sensitive, it's very good at screening. It's good at ruling things out, meaning the false negatives are very low. High sensitivity, false negative very low. Which means if you have a positive test, you're more likely to have it. If you have a negative test, you're more likely not to have it. Sensitivity. Specificity is the opposite. Specificity is good at ruling things in, which none of these are good at. None of these are good at ruling things in. But sacral sulcus test, if it's negative, you're unlikely to have sacroiliac joint pain. Does that make sense to everyone? Sensitivity, specificity. Uh, pelvic symmetry we talked about. Iliac crest symmetry. If there's a leg length discrepancy, it's not uncommon. If the patient doesn't correct for that with a heel lift or a wedge, and they have a pelvic imbalance, they could put more load on the downside, causing some increased forces. I've seen that present with sacroiliac joint pain. So doing that exam and assessing leg length, assessing pelvic symmetry are very important. Uh, standing flexion test, sitting flexion test, all similar to the modified Gillet test that I described earlier. Um, standing, seated, this is kind of what it looks like. What else could it be, though, if it's not sacroiliac joint pain? We talked about discogenic pain, radiating pain, radiculitis, sciatica, facet pain. What about an intraarticular hip pathology? Hello. Sorry, guys. What happened here? Or while he's setting it up. So, intraarticular hip pathology. 
Classically, when someone has an intra-articular hip problem, where do you think they typically have pain? Classic. Groin, right? You think it's groin, you're going to do some provocative hip exam maneuvers, flexion, internal rotation, adduction, and if they get groin pain, you're like, this is a hip problem. Let's treat it as such. Every once in a while, you will have an intra-articular hip problem present isolated buttock pain. I can't fully explain why, and it tricks me every time. Patients come in with butt pain, you do some provocative exam maneuvers, the groin pain is negative, you start treating buttock pain, piriformis, glutes, SI joint, and none of those are providing the patient with relief, an SI belt. And there are times where I've said, let's just try a hip injection. Let's just put anesthetic into the hip joint and see what happens. And I know in the last six months, this probably happens once a month, all of their butt pain goes away. And it's always surprising to me. My theory is that there's some element of the posterior capsule that's causing pathology. It's causing isolated butt pain. So despite the hip provocative exam maneuvers, I cannot get any groin pain with the hip problem. So that's why doing the exam, doing, again, if you have someone who can do the injection or do the injection yourself is super helpful. Are we back in? I hope. Uh, so hip arthritis. Disc herniations. Disc herniations don't always have to cause sciatica. They don't always have to cause radiculitis or radiculopathy or radicular pain. They can cause isolated butt pain. And that's where the history, the physical exam, what makes it better, what makes it worse can be super helpful. Piriformis syndrome. I tend to see this semi-regularly. I think it's related to weakness of the glutes. The glutes are overstretched. We're sitting like we're sitting now. Our glutes are stretched. They get foreshortened. They spasm. My philosophy on spasms and spasticity, not, neuro, not neurologic spasticity, but muscle spasticity, is due to muscles that tend to be overstretched and a little bit of weak. Your brain takes over that muscle and starts causing a spasm. We get it very commonly in our upper back, between our shoulder blades, our rhomboids, our levator scapula, because we're protracted. We're not retracted. So we're protracted, those muscles stretch, they spasm, you get pain. Underneath the shoulder blades, up to the traps, cervicogenic headaches, which is beyond the scope of this conversation, but it's all kind of related to muscle imbalance, muscles being overstretched. Um, could be a fracture. It's not uncommon that uh, we, you know, we see a lot of runners in New York, especially around the time of the marathon. Uh, so sacral stress fractures can present with buttock pain. Could be PSIS tenderness. You feel, you press on it, it hurts. You're thinking SI joint pain. You start treating it because we don't get imaging right away for SI joint problem. We start treating it. And if patients are not responsive to some of our conservative treatments, then yeah, we get a picture. Even if I got an x-ray on this patient, x-ray would probably be normal. It'd be tough to see this on x-ray, which is why a cross-sectional CT scan will help. Bone scan, I mean, we rarely get those for anyone, really. I mean, very rarely can you get a bone scan. I don't know if you guys order bone scans where you practice, but not common. MRI, obviously helpful in this setting with a sacral stress fracture. Who would have a normal CT scan, normal x-ray? just not responsive to any treatments. Imaging, by and large, is not very beneficial for sacroiliac joint pathology because it is, a, in my opinion, a micromotion disease. It's a muscle imbalance disease, hip flexor tights, glute abductors, weak, uh, causing pain. It's not an arthropathy. Very rarely do you see sacroiliitis. I mean, you have to have some type of rheumatologic condition, uh, but I've probably seen it a handful of times. True sacroiliitis, inflammation of the SI joint. So, you diagnose someone with SI joint, you confirm it, you do some of your provocative exam maneuvers, maybe you have the opportunity to do an intra-articular injection. What do we do? What do we do with patients with SI joint pain? So, initially, the same thing we do for most arthropathies or ligament injuries or tendon injuries, rest. Use non-steroid anti-inflammatories if they can tolerate it, if they don't have a contraindication. Uh, correcting the asymmetries that I mentioned, the muscle imbalances. One thing that our patients don't like hearing is that they're weak. They don't like hearing that. You know, I exercise all the time. How could I possibly be weak? So instead of me telling the patient they're weak, what I tell them is you're super strong in your hip flexor. You're not as strong in, in your hip abductor. So there's muscle imbalance there. That kind of allows them to listen to what I'm saying. If I say you're weak, they completely kind of shut down and get defensive. So that's how I kind of phrase it. I think most of us in this room are probably tighter and stronger in our hip flexors than we are in our glute abductors. 
And the way to figure that out is to do split squats, single leg squats, and learn for yourself if your glutes are weak. I did glutes this morning, so it's, I'm weak. I get it. So after the first three days of rest and NSAIDs and ice, then it's time for muscle reactivation, muscle energy. Uh, ice stress, single leg exercises, multiplanar exercises. If you have access to like a BOSU ball or a, a balance board, that can really trigger some of these muscles, especially the glutes, to turn on. But it's not going to be effective unless we correct the tight muscle, which is our hip flexor. And I think most of our patients, even us, we kind of neglect stretching for strengthening. And unless we stretch out that hip flexor, we're not going to get a good outcome. Um, and then maintenance. This is the hardest part. This is why we all have a job, because nobody wants to do the maintenance. Once they're out of pain, they go back to what they were doing the last 10, 15 years. Then they come back three months later, and the same problem occurs. Because we're human, right? We only treat things when we feel things. And if we're feeling okay, we stop doing our medicine and our homework, which is exercise. Core, st core stabilization, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Um, orthotics and shoe modifications, if necessary. For women especially, especially pregnant women who get sick or leg joint pain, there isn't much we can do. We can't really give them medications. We can't give them injections that are fluoroscopic guided. Sometimes with ultrasound guidance, we can. Uh, but an SI joint belt, or it's a Sorola belt, the one that we sell, uh, can be effective. What an SI joint belt is really doing is just stabilizing the joint. It's stabilizing the muscles around it that are not doing their job as well as they should. I don't like this for long-term use. But for an acute episode where the, the pregnant mother or whoever can't do things, I think it's very effective. Two weeks, three weeks, slowly start discontinuing it. Use ice, start stretching. Uh, manual treatment's very effective. Chiropractor, I've been to a chiropractor when I had an SI joint problem. Um, it's helpful passively in realigning me, but if I don't balance that with active exercise, it's gonna revert back to where it was. So manual therapies are great for patients, but you have to educate them, you have to do the work. After the, after the passive modalities. Uh, rectus femoris stretching, anterior hip mobilization, we've talked about this before. Piriformis stretching, pigeon pose, and yoga. Uh, again, these are just ways to release some of the tight muscles around your SI joint. Different ways to do that. Hip flexors are not just in one plane. You know, the pination of our hip flexor muscles, our iliacus, our psoas muscles are different in each one of us. So it's important to stretch out the hip flexor in multiple different planes. So both in a sagittal direction, but also rotated towards, ro rotated away. That's gonna stretch the different areas of the hip flexor that will really make a difference. And I say to all of us in this room, we have to practice what we preach. So if we're doing these things, we can convince the patients that, listen, you're gonna get a good outcome uh, if you do that. Hamstrings, same thing. We all have tighter hamstrings than we do glutes. So stretching out the hamstrings can be important. Uh, core stabilization, this is a glute bridge, glute activation, or a single leg glute bridge. Uh, good way to strengthen the, ha strengthen the hamstrings, strengthen the glutes, uh, but also the um, medius and minimus on the side. Cat camel, again, I'm just giving you examples of different exercises that we offer patients who come in with low back pain, typically caused by sacroiliac really joint dysfunction. And once they're in kind of a, a better, not acute, painful stage, then we get to more dynamic exercise, Swiss ball stabilization. Uh, all things for maintenance. The biggest thing is maintenance. Once you get the patient out of pain, it's really important to keep them active doing some of these different exercises. So we've talked about some of the conservative things, ice, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, physical therapy for sure. I think if we miss any of those three things, then we're doing the patients a disservice. In the United States, patients tend to be pretty lazy. Nobody wants to do the work. I don't know how it is where you guys practice. They just want a quick fix. Fix me, I'm in pain, let me go back to work or doing what I want to do. So I tell the patients, listen, I can give you an injection. It will probably make you feel better. But if you don't go back and do the work, strengthen the muscles, stretch out the tight muscles, we're going to be back here in six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks. Um, but one of the treatments that we do offer is a fluoroscopic and now uh, more often than not an ultrasound guided uh, injection. Basically, the purpose of the injection is twofold. One, it's diagnostic, because we do use anesthetic. Then there's the argument of using a steroid or not. If we believe, and I believe that this is a micro-motion pathology and not a true inflammatory pathology, what is the advantage of using a steroid? So we published a paper six years ago looking at steroid versus not steroid, looking at steroid versus PRP. The steroid has no value. 
to SI joint pathology. Why steroids tend to work is because they go to your system. Patients feel good. You give someone a steroid or a prednisone, obviously they're going to feel good. But into the SI joint, I found that there's no value in doing a steroid sacred iliac joint injection. So the way that most of us are taught, again, the lights aren't great here, uh, the way that most of us are taught to do a sacred iliac joint injection is in the inferior pole of the joint. Can you guys see it? Okay. Basically, this is your iliac crest. you see my mouse? Yeah, maybe. This is the iliac crest. This is the sacrum. Top portion of the joint, inferior recess of the joint, where it's mostly articular. And because I believe that the pathology is not synovial-based, it's not true arth arthropathy, I no longer do the injection in the inferior recess. I do all of my injections up here in the proximal portion. And the reason for that is, one, I believe that that's where all the ligamentous structures are. That's where the motion is occurring. And two, once I diagnose that the pain is coming from the SI joint, so I put the needle up here, right there. Once I diagnose that the pain is coming from the SI joint, then I offer them other options. Rarely a steroid injection. Typically, some type of orthobiologic or regenerative medicine. Dr. Sue's going to talk to you about that, like PRP or some stem cell derived therapies. Uh, but steroids typically don't work. Again, just some pictures of what the joint looks like. And remember the orientation of the joint. The orientation is posterior to anterior, medial to lateral. So it looks like this. If you put your hands like this, this is what the joint looks like. And why that's important is how to test it. You want to test it in the plane of the joint. And it's also relevant for when you do an injection, what joint line you're looking at. The medial joint is going to be the posterior one. The lateral joint is going to be the anterior. Sorry, just some extra pictures of interventions. Does anyone do sacral iliac joint interventions? Maybe with ultrasound guidance or look at it with ultrasound? All right, we'll try to look at it this week uh, with the ultrasound machine. Uh, but this is what it ideally looks like. It, r it rarely looks like this when you do an SI joint injection. It's very tough to get that flow. And on a lateral projection, you can see how far anterior the SI joint actually travels. So the needle's coming in from the posterior, inferior recess. This is all synovium. The rest is all fibrous. The other treatment we do, again, this is um, relatively newer, is an SI joint denervation. This is radiofrequency ablation. We offer the same treatment for lumbar facet, cervical facet, any facets, to be honest. We do the same for geniculars, for knee arthritis. We do a radiofrequency ablation. Uh, basically, this procedure is to identify which nerve or nerves are causing the pain and supplying the sacroiliac joint. The most common nerves are L5 dorsal ramus which lives right here by the L S1, S1 um, superarticular process, the S1 lateral branch, sorry, and the S2 lateral branch. Those are the common three. Every once in a while, you'll get some innervation from the L4, uh, or you'll get it from the S3. So when we do this procedure to denervate the sacroiliac joint, we target at least four nerves. This was a cadaver study laying out um, hyperopaque wires over the different sacral nerves, and this is what they look like on x-ray. You can kind of see them. This is S3, S2, and S3 down here at the bottom. So the orientation is relevant because when you do the nerve block or when you do the radiofrequency ablation, it's important to know where to put the needle. This is gross dissection. You can see the lateral branch of the S1. Here's L5 up here. Here's your S1 dorsal foramen, and this is the nerve going right to the SI joint. There's a, sorry, S, S1, S2 down here, S3 right there, and S4, which we rarely do. Um, this was more for my pain fellows. So this is what it looks like when you do a radiofrequency ablation. Again, the needle is here at the L5 dorsal ramus. One needle here at the S1. This is the S1 foramen. Here's S2. Skin starting points, again, more technical uh, slides for interventional purposes. <coughs> lateral projection, S2 right here. Lateral of S2. Another technique that we used to use that uh, we've shown to be no longer effective is to put needles into the SI joint and just do a strip lesion and ablate the entire thing. Seems hyper-destructive. I tend to agree with that. It's not very accurate when treating SI joint pain. Instead, this is a much more accurate way to treat SI joint pathology. 
Now, when I do a radio frequency abl ablation, I am denervating the nerves that supply the joint. I'm just getting rid of your pain. I'm not fixing the problem, and I tell patients that. So if I get rid of your pain, and you can do exercise, and you can function, and you can do all the things I want you to do, pain-free, these nerves will regenerate. They will come back in six months, or nine months, or 12 months. So it's that window where it's very important to do the home exercise program, go to physical therapy, do all the, all the important measures. Uh, again, just another schematic of all the different areas to ablate. We don't need to do this anymore. The lesion size of the needle that we use is much bigger, so we can put one needle at each. Simplicity I'm going to skip because we don't offer that. So SI joint, common problem. I think it's underdiagnosed. It's overlooked for bigger issues like disc herniations, like facet arthropathy. I believe mostly SI joint pain is a problem of muscle imbalance, tight muscles versus weak muscles. Treatments, conservative things work, physical therapy, NSAIDs, manual therapy, bracing, SI belts. If patients are non-responsive to those, then we go to the interventions. You can do an intraarticular injection, you can do a ligament injection with ultrasound. And then based on that, if there is a hypermobility syndrome, we can offer something like prolotherapy. Prolotherapy can use a dextrose solution to cause a little bit of irritation of the ligaments to stabilize it, or you can use PRP. We did a study comparing PRP to steroid injections, and PRP was superior. Again, the biggest challenge with that study is inclusion criteria. You have to pick patients with true SI joint pathology to, en to enroll them. Denervation is something we offer. I don't love to do it, again, because we're destroying nerves, we're destroying tissue. If we can fix it without a denervation, that's my preference. Uh, and the last is a sacroiliac joint arthrodesis. I'm not sure if some of the spine surgeons here, orthopedic surgeons, do a fusion across the SI joint. It can help. I mean, I, I try to avoid it in patients if we can. Uh, sometimes you just can't. We've done the ablations, they help temporarily, but there's just this laxity that's not getting fixed with anything. At that point, referring them to your spine surgery colleagues for a fusion could be appropriate. Um, so things that I mentioned, optimal treatment is really unknown. Starting conservative, just like any other musculoskeletal condition, is beneficial. A lot of new techniques and new innovations are coming out, especially in the United States, with minimally invasive fusions, with minimally invasive radiofrequency ablation techniques. We tend to use a lot of orthobiologics, PRP, stem cells, bone marrow, prolotherapy to help with the ligamentous instability, um, but just things to think about when you're offering patients uh, treatments for SI joint pain. Okay, we got through that very fast. All right, open it up to questions.